All right, it's looking like we're leveling off here a little bit. So welcome to uh, to Integral Circles. Uh, this installment of our, uh, we've got kind of an ongoing series that we've been doing. Uh, and this this installment features an award-winning multi multimedia producer um, and someone who I think of as just a, you know, somebody with a social media Midas touch, uh, George Faulkner. Uh, George, welcome. Thanks, Ethan. Great to see you, of course. And uh, you are in sunny Brooklyn. Is it sunny? It's fairly sunny. It is quite sunny in Brooklyn, yes. <laughs> That's great. Well, I'm up here. Uh, I'm usually a, a Brooklyn resident myself, as you know, but I'm up here in Massachusetts and we've got like a foot and a half of snow today, which is, uh, which is super fun. Uh, so, but it also means that you may hear my kids in the background or they may come bursting in asking for help with their mittens. Uh, we never know. Um, so we're going to kick off in a second here uh, our integral circles uh, featuring uh, George Faulkner. Uh, we're going to be talking about podcasting specifically to employees. Um, but first, I want to just encourage everybody who's joining, everybody who's joining right now, just to take a look at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I know uh, we've all been in like a gazillion Zooms at this point, but um, if you haven't ever uh, offered a question or a comment. Uh, today could be your first time. Uh, there's uh, no pressure. You'll see that there's a little chat thing there. If you want to just uh, reach out to other folks who are in, uh, you know, in the uh, in this um, uh, webinar with you, um, or if you want to ask a question, a specific uh, question, uh, we'd love to see you click that Q and A button. And it's pretty easy. Once you uh, see Q and A, uh, you click the button, and you can just sort of add your your question there. I'm going to keep an eye on that stuff um, and then feed those questions over to George just to make sure that we have a good dialogue going there. So um, once again, uh, welcome everybody to Integral Circles uh, on podcasting for employees. And uh, George, I'm going to just turn it right over to you. So why don't you take it away? Thanks, Ethan. Um, and hello, everyone, wherever you are. Um, I have a long history in uh, content creation. Um, and I just thought I would show this slide really quickly to give you a bit of a background on my sequential journey through, uh, through the world of content. I started as a musician, as a teen. Uh, because I was a musician, I decided that I wanted to learn audio engineering. Uh, and I was sort of forced into marketing my uh, bands and record label and things like that. Um, I then dabbled in uh, work in television and film as a production assistant here in New York City, working on really huge um, TV shows and, and movies where I picked up a lot. And then I moved into a corporate gig inside of marketing and communications, communications specifically. Uh, and we had a, a a huge focus on building materials to help influence both our employee base and our investors. Uh, and then somewhere in the mid 2000s, I think it may have been actually 2005, um, our company got really interested in creating content and utilizing social media. Uh, and I was put in charge of launching um, podcasting. Um, uh, for the company globally. And we started internally. Uh, this was, let's create content for one another. Let's see what resonates. Let's learn how to do it. You know, it's sort of a practice makes perfect scenario. And we had the infrastructure to be able to do that. Um, then we got really serious about social media in general. Ethan knows all about this. Uh, he was there and, and we spent years um, with very low budget um, sort of content um, uh, to do's. How do we effectively reach as many people as we can for the least amount of, of um, expense? And um, that slowly and slowly built over the years where we built trust and we were then given carte blanche to make amazing stuff. So I got into multi being a multimedia producer, making films, things like that, uh, and then experiential um, production, building physical things, creating experiences uh, at 
um, company facilities. Uh, and then eventually I just sort of became the lead of the full social program um, for the company. And that involved everything you can imagine, you know, enablement and um, uh, standards and guidelines, content production, publishing, et cetera. So that's a really long way of saying I've been doing this for a long time. And um, I hope that, you know, you guys can all learn something today from us. So let's let's dig in. Um, why should people podcast? Uh, you know, the world is swimming in podcasts, um, and there's a reason, right? They're they're easy to produce. You know, I said I make films. Films are not easy to produce. Um, I've worked with a lot of graphic designers. That is intense work. Um, there's a low barrier uh, to entry for podcasting. The, the tools are inexpensive. Um, they can pretty much be done anywhere, uh, uh, in the field, at home, in the office. Um, and if, you know, depending on the editorial strategy that you decide to go with, let's say you decide to go with uh, an interview style show, it's, it just, it's, it's like an hour's worth of work with an hour's worth of editing. It literally can be done incredibly quickly. Um, another plus is because it's really comfortable for uh, guests. I've learned over the years that, especially in a business setting, most people don't like when you point a camera in their face and turn on a couple of bright lights um, and and start asking them you know, questions that, you hope they will answer honestly and openly. They they quickly just sort of get into like regurgitating uh, stump speech materials. Um, when you're in an intimate setting and it's just a couple of people, let's say, having a conversation with a microphone, um, people have a tendency to really open up a lot more. Um, and number three, it's easier on editors, right? This is a linear process. It's like editing a Word document, right? a conversation that you have participated in that you recall when you put it you know, into your audio editing um, uh, software is very easy to, to work with. I wanna drop this section, I wanna move this section over here and I'm done, right? I wanna get out a little, a few pops and clicks and remove some ums. It's not, it's, you know, with a little bit of practice, it's really not, uh, all that challenging. And the biggest is that it's convenient for listeners. I mean, all, everything that we're doing in content obviously is for the audience, uh, especially if we have a very targeted group of people uh, that we're trying to reach. And podcasts are, you know, click to download or subscribe to auto download. And then, um, you know, the audience just has it on their devices and they can listen to it when it's convenient for them. Uh, and hence, I think their popularity. Um, why should you not podcast? Um, and I touched on it before, but it's primarily because everybody's doing it. It's a crowded playing field and um, you've got to be really good to cut through the noise. You know, it's, it takes a lot of pre-planning to come up with an, an idea that will resonate. And it takes planning to come up with the right talent, uh, stories, ideas, people, initiatives, whatever it might be. Um, it's all in the pre, in the work that leads up to recording day. Um, and if, if you really cross your T's and dot your I's, you're going to be great. Um, takes a little practice maybe, but, uh, uh, it's, it's possible. But, um, what I say at the bottom, I think is <clears throat> important, right? It's, it's for the uninitiated and for those who have never really practiced doing it, it's very, very hard to be interesting and it takes work. 
Um, and if your show isn't interesting, you don't have much to go on uh, in terms of publishing and, and pushing. This is our last slide. Uh, and I'm gonna try to talk through each one of these pieces fairly quickly. Um, and as Ethan said before, you know, um, this might be where you have some inspiration for questions. This is all about questions. This is all about us uh, having a, a, a dialogue here after this slide and not turning this into a PowerPoint presentation. Any question is, is fine. Um, so think about that as we step through these. To me, these are the nine essential elements of a podcast series, right? This is a series-based um, uh, content process. A single episode is not a podcast. A podcast has a number of episodes that are tied together. And understanding what the brand is of the podcast itself and understanding what the editorial approach is um, are both you know, very important. This covers sound, what it sounds like. There's a sonic brand that you wanna to try to come up with. And that has to do with maybe just the way the show flows, right? The sequence that the show follows. And you wanna to try to do that you know, time and time again so that people get comfortable with that format. If it's a good format, they're gonna love you for it. Um, so that editorial framework is important. The sound is important. And understanding you know, who you're trying to target, who's the audience, that will help you to shape you know, that sort of brand and editorial. So the visual mark and the sonic stamp um, are both uh, really critical to great uh, podcasting. Um, the next item is selecting hosts and guests. You know, I think, um, uh, trying to find hosts who are not only uh, inquisitive, curious people um, uh, is important, but they also need to have some level of empathy, right? They have to be tremendously good listeners um, and they have to be the kinds of people who allow conversations to flow. Um, uh, and, you know, um, it's, it's not easy to find a great host. It's not easy to find people who are really skilled at this. And if you yourself think you might be the, the, the host, these are things you need to practice uh, and learn. And, you know, in terms of guests, what I always say in the business setting is try not to get too stuck selecting your guests based on their job title. You want to find people based more on what they're passionate about and what they know and what they want to be talking about. You wanna to try to avoid people who are disinterested in the conversation to begin with. You know, <laughs> you, want, you, want the, um, you want the segment to have some life uh, and some joy uh, and, and something compelling to it. Um, so to me, that's like, that's the big one uh, with selecting George? guests. Yes, we're, Ethan. Uh, we're getting some great questions. Uh, I'm just gonna remind everybody, keep the questions coming in about five minutes. Uh, George will be uh, done just walking through these nine elements and we're gonna start to pivot over to the questions. So please keep them coming. Thanks, Ethan. Um, the next piece, interviewing and storytelling. You know, um, you wanna do your homework. You wanna, you know, you want to self uh, uh, to, to, to be sort of self-motivated in looking into the topic that will be discussed. Uh, and then you wanna get to know your guest a little bit prior to the recording. Um, just have some sort of a, a quick phone call maybe to get to know one another just a little bit. Um, it's um, uh, uh, interviewing is a difficult skill right? Many people believe that it's about following a list of questions. And I don't believe that uh, at all. I think it's important to have a few questions at the ready, but I prefer having sort of an outline for the discussion as opposed to a set list of questions. The problem with questions is uh, you as the interviewer tend to lean on them a little too much and you break up the conversation. You might not allow the conversation to flow naturally 
if you keep looking at your sheet and go back, you know, you kind of you're you're kind of pulling the conversation away from where it's naturally going. Um, so be careful with that uh, as an interviewer. Um, recording locations, right? Um, the 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 key to an intimate um, conversational, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, an interview where you're really connecting with one another is being in a physical space that is non-distracting, right? Creaky chairs and and creaky tables and humming lights and and laptop fans and people walking in and out. You've got to try to avoid all of that. Um, you can get a great recording in virtually any physical space that is without distractions. And I think that's probably one of the key, key goals that you should shoot for when choosing a location. Um, recording gear, I mean, I could talk for an hour about this, but I'll just simply say uh, now more than ever before, uh, you can get your hands on really high quality equipment at an incredibly low, low price. Um, there are uh, um, audio production machines uh, in front of all of you right now. You know, the laptop or the desktop that you're using can do three quarters of the job uh, of creating a podcast. All you need um, is a couple of uh, microphones um, and you can, you'd be amazed what you, what you can, can do uh, with just a couple microphones and a laptop. Um, recording techniques uh, is, you know, um, goes back to that sort of notion that, that excellent sound is gonna make a huge difference, right? If part of your brand is delivering excellent audio to your listeners. Um, you need to understand recording techniques um, to some degree. The main technique being the one that's pictured. Um, you don't want people up against the microphone, but you don't want them too far away from the microphone. And that one thing right there in that, in that image uh, will, will help you to um, have a consistent sound, excellent sound, clear, present sound, uh, and is, um, you know, uh, uh, something that I would highly recommend. Editing is tough. I'll, I, I'd say it's probably the, the outside of pre-planning and pre-production, editing's the piece that probably requires more practice um, than you would imagine. But as I said before, you know, it's linear and you can learn it pretty quickly uh, if you just practice. Um, and I'll say this, I mean, I learned um, by editing um, songs, existing music. I would take a song off of a record, throw it into my editor, and I would try to figure out how to take pieces of it and move it around to make the song longer and sensible. Um, and it was a fun way uh, to learn how to edit um, uh, long ago. Um, software is another piece of editing. There's a lot of free software out there. We could talk about that in the Q&A if you want. Um, and there are a lot of sort of little tips and tricks uh, that we should probably talk about if you have any questions about that in regard to having your episodes have sonic punch. Um, to really sort of be even and present. Uh, and we could certainly um, get into that. Marketing, you know, isn't necessarily what we're here to talk about, but I think, you know, without marketing skills, uh, it doesn't matter how amazing your content is, you're going to have trouble uh, getting it out to your employees. You're going to have trouble getting it out to the world. Uh, you're going to have trouble getting it out to your targets. And, um, yeah, you've got to have an excellent series to begin with. Um, but, um, you know, it doesn't, uh, that doesn't, um, uh, doesn't mean that you, you ha that you can bypass networking, nurturing, um, building relationships, building community, 
uh, and and sh and 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 keeping the ball rolling in between the episode launches. Um, and then measuring success, recognizing success. How do you know uh, that you're being successful? Um, you know, listens, yeah. Um, play duration, you know, is great. Likes, shares, all of that is great. I just, I'm not a big fan of um, counting pre-roll numbers and impressions. That's, that's the one, you know, little nit that I have. I kind of like, I kind of like, you know, setting up my own KPIs based on what I know about my audience, what I want to get from the program itself, what I think I can get from the targets, uh, and then measuring based on really, really actionable um, or, you know, real actions that the listener has taken. Um, and that is like the fastest I've ever stepped through podcasting in my entire life. Um, I hope uh, I hope you guys have some questions. <laughs> you you did so so great there, George. Um, do you want to just show that um, that last slide so that people know where to find us? But while you while you do that, um, I wanted to just uh, just real quick say you know a quick compliment for you because with somebody who has the depth of experience that you that you have. I mean, each one of those pillars, it, you could you could really spend, you know, you said you could spend an hour on selecting the right mic. I'm sure, you know, that's, even that's an understatement. Um, so I really appreciate how you gave such a great overview of all of those sort of key factors for success. So thank you for that. Um, uh, we have a ton of great questions if you wanna um, just go into uh, Q&A mode here. Um, why don't we start with the topic that you just um, sort of stepped off of, and maybe this is something we can share a little bit. Um, one of the questions um, that we got was, how do you measure the success of, of a podcast? So thank you for the, uh, the person who, who asked that. And you, you sort of started to focus in on behaviors. Yeah, I, you know, look, let's be realistic. Most of it is based on the tools that you have and the metrics that you're being given by those tools. The thing is most of the, you know, podcast tools out there are elevating impressions over of other things, right? They wanna give you the big numbers. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just here to say, just beware of those numbers um, because, you know, um, they make a lot more sense to me personally in advertising uh, they don't necessarily make a whole lot of sense in, um, you know, uh, more sort of social content endeavors, organic endeavors. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, to me, like, like complete listens are the thing that thrill me the most and are the thing that I think any boss I've ever had is going to say, wow, that's fantastic. You know, it, it hurts to reveal the honest truth. And it's hard to deliver the smaller numbers ahead of the bigger numbers. But you know, when you get a million hits on a YouTube video, uh, but you go into the back end and realize that everybody hits stop after 10 seconds, <laughs> you know, you just, you don't want to run with that a little, little bit of a letdown there, right? Yeah. Right. Well, um, you know, so. it, it makes me think, thanks for that, George. And I, it makes me think of um, the work that we did. So we obviously can't reveal the names of uh, the clients that we've um, done this kind of work for, but with one of the large organizations in which we have done podcasting as an employee focused program, uh, we saw, we did look at, okay, well, how many times is this episode being played? Um, but also over time. So were people returning to it later? So that's one of those things that's kind of interesting about podcasting is that people will return. There's kind of a shelf life thing that happens there. But then also we created an environment in which people could ask questions and pose comments um, to the people who, the, the, the host and the guests of the podcast and seeing the, qual not the number of those, but the quality of those interactions, which is sort of to your point about um, nurturing, right? Yeah, and 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 the launch, right? Um, it's it gets a little. I hope this makes sense to everybody. But you know, when you launch your series, you're trying to get people to subscribe to your series. After you launch, 
you still want them to subscribe, but you also want them to listen right? Because they may have made a decision not to subscribe, you know, and, and so you've got to kind of, you know, um, uh, run yourself through a bit of a, a bit of a, an arc that is influenced by the fact that it, that it is a subscription-based content endeavor. Yeah. And really reaching those people at an emotional level. It's like in the article that you published on our, on our website, uh, on our blog, uh, reaching those people on an emotional level and getting that hook in. I mean, that's the real KPI. Very hard to measure, but that's really it. I've got another question for you uh, about platforms. Uh, what platforms do you recommend for hosting an internal podcast? Is it better to be on a private platform or public? So we went through this with uh, the client that Ethan referenced uh, before and um I'll, I'll, you know, Ethan, you can, you can help me out here because sure. it gets, it gets a little complicated, but um, we did sort of hone in on having a great appreciation for Podbean uh, after we did an awful lot of uh, uh, um, sort of examination of, of a number of different platforms. Um, the thing is, for a private podcast um, platform, you run into some issues, uh, at least right now, that, um, that every platform will promise you they're working on and are gonna fix. Um, and that is to have a fully private uh, podcast. You either need to have something that's being delivered with, um, um, authentication involved uh, and or something that um, has to be done through uh, enterprise devices, right? A company device that's, that's you know, on the VPN um, or you run the risk of files sort of getting out there. Now, you know, <laughs> even if they're on the... In you know, even if you've incorporated a platform into your intranet, those files can still get out. We, let's not, you know, fool ourselves. Um, so there's not a great answer for this question. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's like, yeah, well, it's really tricky. And I, I think that is a great answer. The reality is anytime that you, I mean, like literally the word cast is in there because it's broadcast. You are sending out a file. <laughs> Anytime you're sending out a digital file to, you know, to potentially tens of thousands of people, depending on the size of your organization, there's a very good chance that it's going to be disseminated or, or you know, beyond your intention. And so um, our recommendation generally is, uh, if you can, um, ensure that the content is, um, is great and it's also something that you feel good about getting out. Because in fact, those internal podcasts can be brand building and they can be very positive and particularly when it comes to recruitment um, for, for, uh, for you know, potential candidates to come into your company to be able to get a little flavor of what it's like to work there before they get in through a really well-produced and intimate podcast. It's a very powerful thing. So it's a good thing to leak that content. Um, yeah, and, and Ethan, one other thing that yeah. we, that we really um, ran up against was the user experience, right? Absolutely. I mean, if you want if you want your audience to um, to feel comfortable in the subscription process, the downloading process, the the listening, the deleting, you know, all the management of the podcast, you kind of I think you know we feel pretty strongly that you're better off providing them uh, uh, with an experience that's utilizing an actual a tool that's actually been built for podcasting. That's right. Not a media management tool, not some kind of internal tool that's also publishing all your videos. You know, it's it, you want them to have a podcast experience. Um, so it's a really great point. So um, moving on, there's a, another question here around frequency, um, and we did do it at frequency and duration. So there are two questions, and we did do a, a bunch of analysis around this. George, maybe you can share a little bit of what we learned about how frequently should this be, and how long should these podcasts be. So a, a lot of this is is you know based on uh, both the editorial decisions that you make in how you want the show to um, present itself. 
Uh, and, you know, um, that could be through trial and error, that could be, you know, uh, through personal preference. Um, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, that's another hard question to answer. I'll say this, New York Times has a show called The Daily. It's on every day. That <laughs> works, right? I mean, and it works because they're telling you the news of the day. Um, if that's your editorial approach, then publish every day, you know. Um, personally, I think uh, you might want to think about it in terms of resources. You might want to say to yourself, all right, am I producing this podcast by myself? Do I have a, a partner? Do I have a team? Um, and how long does it take us to create one excellent episode? Try yeah. one out. Try yeah. two out. Um, I'll tell you this. I once launched a podcast uh, for a company that I worked for where I was trying to mimic um, This American Life. And I was doing it by myself. Uh, and I realized it took me at least a week to make a decent episode. Um, you know, multi-guests, multi-interview, you know, scripted segments, music, everything. And it wasn't sustainable because I had other things to do uh, on the job. And then I realized This American Life has a staff of about 30 people. <laughs> so, you know, just... <laughs> the, you're the, worth the at free... least 15, George, but 30 yeah. is stretch. But I it's like the, how you're the... saying, basically, it's the editorial direction let that drive it plus your actual capacity and i think that's very realistic can you touch on um we did look at the top performing podcasts like what was the the length of those oh um length tends to be for interview shows people seem to like you know anywhere from a half an hour to an hour um and they'll like they'll go forever i think if you are um uh I, and I'm going to add another dimension, Ethan. I don't. Yeah. I don't mean to drive you crazy. You're not driving me crazy. How about this? Your your podcast length should be heavily determined by how long you can be interesting. <laughs> I like that. It's like a like the golden ratio or something. The golden. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's. If any of you have ever been sitting in an interview where your mind starts to drift, that's where the podcast needs to end. Love it. Um, I think we did find, and just, uh, I think we did find when we averaged some of the best performing podcasts, it was something around 16 minutes that we found. It was. Yeah, it was that, that, that's kind of the sweet spot. But again, that's an average um, and an average of, to your point, very different kinds of shows. So, you know, a, yeah. you know, an hour you know, long that's, show that, you know. Yeah, that 16 minutes though was determined in part by trying to keep things moving. Um, it was, it was you know, we decided that we would have like an 11 minute main segment and then another segment of a few minutes yep. to try to like keep it exciting, keep people listening because they'll really want to hear that second segment too. And we wanted to build something. We wanted to build a series. So 16 minutes was a nice, I think a nice compromise for, for what it is that they wanted to do. A great question here from uh, Ray Bunite. I hope I'm saying your name correctly, Ray. Uh, what consideration should be made when producing a podcast for an employee audience versus a uh, the general public? If I were going to be a wise guy, I would say none. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, interesting is interesting. Compelling is compelling. Great is great, right? Um, but, you know, uh, look, you know, it's, it depends on what it is that your workforce is thirsting for, right? Think about the audience. What is it that they, what are the questions that, you know, that the company keeps receiving that nobody seems to be answering? You mm. can think about it that way, right? You know, what is it that, that, that people need to feel connected during the pandemic, right? You could think about it that way. You know, we've eliminated the water cooler uh, from everyone's lives. I mean, especially here in the United States. Uh, and how can we help to create something where people still feel connected? There are a million answers to that question, um, I think. And, you know, it goes from, uh, I would say that, you know, just off the top of my head, here's three quick sort of corporate, 
employee podcasts, right? One would be, you know, top line strategies so everybody feels informed about where the company is headed. Allow them to get a glimpse into where things are going and what they need to know. So what do you need to know? Uh, another category could be, um, you know, just allowing people to uh, meet with one another within their particular area of the business. So, you know, these are people who have common sort of struggles, common questions, common goals, and you can help to sort of pad that out. And then the third, like, you know, uh, Ethan and I in the past have done things that are just pure entertainment just to get people to tune in, right? We had a game show <laughs> called uh, Just a Minute that was about um, guessing acronyms. You had one minute to guess as many acronyms as you could, and it was filmed in front of a live audience. It was huge. People loved it, and it got them into the podcast space. It just it brought them into the library where you know they were then noticing the other things that they might be able to right. listen to. So there's a million answers to that question. I love that. And I think, um, I don't think you were being a wise guy. I think you were being a wise guy uh, by saying that, <laughs> that quality is quality. And one of the things that we have seen, or, uh, you know, when we've worked with um, various clients is that they forget that and they think, you know, oh, you know what we'll do is we'll podcast the sales cadence call. Um, or we'll, you know, we'll podcast, you know, we'll record a meeting and put that on pod. And it, it's like, right. yeah, no, actually, that's not interesting. And so don't podcast that not helpful. Um, I've got another question for you here. Uh, that is um, uh, from Wendy Morphew. Uh, great to see your name there, Wendy. Uh, what is your advice as a host when things start going south with a guest, or he or she becomes boring or starts speaking in corporate speak? Yeah, that's, that's a good one, Wendy, and hang in there with me on this, um, because I do have an answer. I learned, and maybe my personality and my approach uh, helped to dictate this. Um, I learned that when people who kind of don't want to be there, and or people who just can't break away from the script, um, when that happens, I work to get the, um, their outline out of their hands, their physical sheet of paper that they're working off of um, is one thing. Another is I keep them talking and I go back to questions that I didn't feel were answered satisfactorily because they're reaching the point where they're frustrated with you and that second version of the answer is gonna be so much better than the first one mm. because they've kind of lost their patience. You can edit out all of the things that indicate that they might be a little frustrated, but the <laughs> second time they answer the question, it'll be more succinct. It'll be just to the point quick and it and, and will be like stump speech free. Uh, so that's one thing. And then, um, you know, you can Google this or, you know, you can get in touch with us and we can help you with this. I like having sort of um, questions that come from left field that break stuff up. When, when the conversation has already broken, break it more. You know, ask a ridiculous question, get them out of that headspace that they're in. Uh, I've been known to use the line, what makes you think you're so smart? <laughs> and you get this like surprised look, you know, but then they relax and they laugh. And then sometimes you get just a magical answer. It's like, well, actually I'm not that smart. It's like, I've got this great team and, you know, and the journey was challenging and difficult and I'm not trying to make it seem like this was easy. You know, yeah. like you just, you got to break things up a little bit and, and you've got to do a little bit of shock, got to throw in a little bit of shock or fun. I love that. Or you can ask them, is a hot dog a sandwich? Exactly. Yeah. But that's exactly what I'm talking about. I love it. I love it. Yep. So um, we've got someone here who's asked a couple questions. I think it's Tanea Nash. She's asked a few questions about some technical stuff. So, so one is um, how best to record a podcast virtually. Um, and then another one is around equipment and brands for start, uh, brands of equipment that uh, maybe to start off. I know you have some perspective about that. I do too. Uh, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Um, 
Okay, the first piece was, wait, say the first piece virtually. again? Recording, recording virtually. Recording virtually, okay. So um, I'm not, take this with a grain of salt, right? Um, I'm not a huge fan of uh, audio that's been recorded over a telephone or over a Zoom webinar. Um, I like crisp, clear audio. So see if you can follow this. What I think people should do is keep the show simple, right? Keep it just two people. Um, and what you do is you each record yourselves and then you combine those files after it's over. So you do, you know, you, 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 it could be your iPhone, you know, it could be your mobile phone, you know, not too far away from your mouth, right? Um, and you use the, 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 um, the recorder that's built into your phone. You could do it with your laptop mic and the audio recording software that's built into every Mac and every Windows machine. Um, you know, get fairly close, hit record, count down, three, two, one, clap, and then you talk. Now, it gets complicated because then how do you see one another and how do you communicate with one another? Um, you need another device for that. You need to be able to sort of, you know, look at one another. So I would say use FaceTime, you know, or use a, a, a video, you know, um, communication system and then record on the laptop and then combine the files later. If that's just too complicated, just do the Zoom, yeah, do the phone Zoom, call, Zoom okay? Great and it works. But you know, yeah. But it, it, does, it does diminish the quality. Um, I, I take your point and I agree with you on that. And then there are some, there's some great uh, software solutions that are out there like Anchor and like Squadcast that do what George was just describing. It take, they sort of knit those two separate recordings together for you. Um, granted, you're going to pay for those. And so what George was just describing, the thing that's so elegant about it is you can get that crisp, crystal clear quality without having to get into a subscription and be paying money and maybe your IT department doesn't want you putting software on your web on your laptop or what have you so um, so that's yeah. great and then um, we've got a couple questions about equipment um, starter brands or equipment or starter microphone I, I want to take a quick stab at it and then I want to turn it over to you um, but um, I would just note that the microphone in your phone, is, is designed to pick up the voice. And so what George just said about using the recorder, not over a cell connection, but literally just using a recorder, that can be really good. And then also um, we're, uh, I don't know if you're, no, I think you're using your AirPods, but um, I'm using a, a mic right now. It's, a, it's, called, it's from a company called Blue. Um, and uh, you can get these, uh, it's a USB mic. It's plugged right into my, uh, it's plugged right into my laptop. You can get a mic like this or equivalent for under a hundred bucks especially if you don't get, I mean, the latest one is going to cost you a lot more, but um, I think this one ended up costing me about $120 and it's, it's great. It's very versatile. So when it comes to microphones, George, what's your pick for a, a good starter mic? Yeah. Starter mic. I would agree with Ethan. The blue Yeti uh, is the particular model uh, that I like and they make a standard size and they make a, a sort of a nano smaller size. Ethan has the standard Yeti. Is that what you have? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, and I've got I've got the Nano. The standard sounds a little better, um, but they're USB microphones that are inexpensive, and they can plug directly into your laptop, and you can just it's plug and record literally. Yeah. Um, and you can get excellent quality if you're you know, um, once you figure out how close you can get to make it sound great and you know not get too close um and then you know another another brand i like is rode r-o-d-e they make a number of sort of podcast mics and recorders and things like that that are uh, that i like a lot that's great and for um for editing the software audacity is a well-known free audio editor of course most folks have something like garage band or whatever running on their laptops you can use that we have time for one last question here we've got a bunch but i want to just and on, on just one, uh, one last one uh, from Rob uh, Drayson, uh, who asks, uh, does a podcast need to be for fully produced or bare bones or Q&A? What's your take on that, George, given that we're talking about the employee audience? It's whatever you want it to be. I mean, 
you know, I always say to people, what do you like to listen to? You know, what do you like? It's, um, I'm not a big fan of artists who try or creators who try to create things that they think people want to hear or see or watch. Uh, I like uh, artists who create things that come from their heart uh, yeah. because people will hear the passion in the program and people will, you know, if you, if you, if you attempt to be an artist uh, creating art for people that you think they want to hear over time, you'll be outed and what comes from your heart will emerge. So why hold it off? It's going to come out eventually anyway. Be yourself, create things that you like to listen to, you know, make the art, the kind of art that you like, and you will have a much better chance of connecting with people. So, I, you know, it's any approach you want. But to answer the question a little more specifically, I think the interview format is a great starter format. George, we got to leave it there. But before we do, I just want to ask you, do you have a recommended, uh, a podcast that you can recommend that you just enjoy listening to? Oh, wow. I mean, you know, I tend to um, gravitate towards podcasts where people talk about how they create. Um, it's like interviews with creators. Yeah. So um, certain episodes of the Adam Buxton show or Here's the Thing or The Art of the Process. The Art of the Process is great with Amy Mann and Ted Leo. You know, I like to learn about the creative process. So that's what I like to listen to. Um, but, you know, on the flip side, I love something like uh, Song Exploder, yeah. uh, where they dissect a piece of work and explain to you step by step how they made it. Like, that's a really cool show, too. That's great. George, thank you very much. And I want to just thank everybody for joining us today. Um, we'd love to hear more from you. Uh, I just put our, uh, our company URL and uh, email address right into the chat. Um, if we did not hit a question that you had, I know there were still a couple of them floating around in there. Um, please drop us a line and I uh, hope you'll uh, be podcasting soon. And of course, we would love to help you if we have the opportunity to do that. Integral is, of course, an employee activation organization. We're focused on employee communications, digital transformation, and culture and change. And uh, we love learning from brilliant people like you. So give us a jingle. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.